Hey everybody, it's Tony Arnold here again from Central Heights Baptist Church. I uh, come to you on this Wednesday night. We're just uh, hopefully you're having a great week and and things are going well for you. Uh, we're, we're getting closer uh, to, to some type of normal. Uh, we heard uh, Governor Ivy, you know, made a, a you know issue that some things will be opening back up, and hopefully uh, May fifteenth we start to see more things and. Uh, eventually we're starting to see a light at the end of the tunnel and we can start to gather again as a church but we're probably a little ways away from that uh, but it is a blessing that we do have technology uh, all the different things that we have today uh, because we can still get to, to speak to each other we live in an age where there's a lot of communication so uh, there is things to be thankful for even though uh, what we're going through right now is unprecedented it's very different but um we want to continue uh, talking uh, about the book of Colossians. We're going to finish up chapter 3 and actually go into the first verse in chapter 4 because it kind of ties in uh, to the end of what chapter 3 is, is talking about. Uh, but, but kind of a quick uh, verse through the book of Colossians, you know, they're, they're trying to fight some false teaching. They established that Jesus is supreme. He is, he's uh, the, he's, uh, uh, has all authority over all things. Uh, that we are made alive in Christ. We're dead in our sin, but we're made alive through what he's done for us, through our faith in him, through us believing in him. And, and then we kind of uh, talked about last week about the list of kind of things that he gives us. There's a, a different kind of thing that happens with our character when we know Christ. And he, he, he calls us to what we say and what we do uh, be about him. Uh, and that's one of my favorite verses in Colossians 3.17 kind of summed that up. And then we're going to kind of get into the end of Colossians, and it talks about the role of the family. Uh, it talks more than that. It talks about, uh, you know, work and uh, some other stuff we're going to talk about, too. But one of the things we're really going to hit on, really going to try to stay with, is the role of the family just because of uh, how, uh, how it closely it ties into what the gospel really teaches us, especially a lot of Paul's writings. Uh, he compares our relationship with Christ uh, to that of the family. So let's read in Colossians. We'll start with verse 18 in Colossians 3, and we'll go through uh, chapter 4, verse 1, uh, and then we'll kind of break it down and talk about it. In verse 18, it says, Wives, submit to your husbands as is fitting to the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. Children, obey your parents in, every, in everything, for this pleases the Lord. Fathers, do not provoke your children, lest they be become discouraged. Bond servants obey in everything those who are your earthly masters, not by way of eye service as people pleasers, but with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. Whatever you do, work heartily as for, as for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive an inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ. For the wrongdoer will be paid back for the wrong he's done, and there is no partiality. And in verse uh, chapter 4, verse 1, it talks about uh, masters treating their, the, their, their servants fairly. Uh, it says, uh, Masters treat your bond servants justly and fairly, knowing that you also have a master in heaven. Um, so we're going to talk about uh, the different things it talks about in that first, uh, the different parts of the role of the family. And then we're actually going to talk about a little bit about why we mentioned masters and bond servants and stuff like that, uh, and especially considering what we know today and what we believe today in today's culture. But the first thing that tells wives to submit to your husbands, and uh, we're going to talk kind of about what that really means, uh, because it, it, it does sound uh, like, a, the, 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 it sounds bad kind of in a lot of people's uh, terms in, in today's society. Uh, but I think the partnership, that if we both do what we're supposed to do as a husband and as a wife, this isn't so bad. Uh, and this is the order that God set it up in. It's the order that's used all throughout Scripture. Uh, but if everybody does their part in the order and does it uh, and, and fulfills the, the last part of verse 18, uh, then we're going to be okay in this. Uh, so it, it does tell wives specifically to submit to their husbands. Uh, and the reason it, it does that is because the order that God created, God created male first and he created female. If you go back to the actual curse, he said that, um, uh, you know, that that's part of the, the whole curse on humanity is, uh, that wives would uh, long for their husbands kind of thing, and that you would be qu required to submit. Now, I'm going to tell you where something deeper gets, uh, when we really think about this, where it gets a lot deeper than this, uh, is it's not always just calling wives to submit to their husbands, but Paul in his writings, he compares us, he says that we're the bride of Christ. He's the groom and we're the bride, so we have to fit kind of in this role. We're to submit to Christ. 
Okay? So what you're really doing by submitting to your husband is you're submitting to the authority that God has placed. Uh, and if the husband is going to do his role, which is going to come next, then he would be worth some, you know, somebody worth listening to, worth under, you know, being under their leadership. But here's what we have to understand about that leadership part. It's not just one over the other. It's more, it's more of a joint thing that we're really trying to do. Uh, that you're, you're trying to do this thing together. Uh, yeah, you may have one leading, uh, but it's, it's a partnership that you've entered into. You know, two people become one person. That's a lot of times what we see when we go to some kind of wedding. Uh, there's a lot of different things. Uh, I've seen two candles lighting one candle. I've seen sand being poured into uh, two different kinds of sand being poured into one thing. And, uh, there's all different ways that, that people represent that in, in weddings and, and, uh, and you know, to kind of illustrate that. But we have to understand that this is part of it too. Uh, that that's actually taking you know something that's biblical to becoming one is actually a biblical thing, so submitting should not be as what it really sounds like. In today's society, uh, people get really slammed. The Bible gets slammed for having this kind of language. But if you look at the next part and you dig kind of deep into what the husband's supposed to do, uh, if a husband's doing what he's supposed to do, submitting to him is going to be all right because he's actually following Christ. So you're not really following just the husband; you're following Christ. You're following Jesus. Because he's going to lead you there. Uh, he's leading you towards him. Uh, so that's that part, is, I think, uh, is important for us to understand. And then we get to the next part and where it talks about what a husband is supposed to do. Husbands are supposed to love their wives. But what does this really mean? What does it really mean to love? Uh, the Bible, love is a complicated word. It means a whole lot of different things. If you actually break down the, the Greek definition, there's several different things uh, that love can mean. We're talking almost an agape kind of love here uh, that it's really talked about. And we know that Jesus gave us a definition of what love is. He told us in John 15, 15, John 15 that there's no greater love than this, than a man to lay down his life for his friends. Uh, he tells us all throughout Scripture about him coming to serve us, right? And that's displaying his love for us, that he would serve us, that he would die for us, uh, that, that he places us above his own wants and desires and that's what a husband should do he should place his wife and his children his family uh he should place uh, them above he's thinking about them with the decisions that he's making so if he's doing that he's thinking about them with the decisions that he's making and he's really seeking christ then he's going to lead the right way he's going to be somebody worth following uh worth following their lead another thing it says in the end of verse 18 it says, as is fitting to the Lord, and it mentions this in a different kind of way, uh, you know, all throughout the scripture. It's mentioned several times, uh, not exact same way, but it's mentioned several times in scripture uh, because this stuff is supposed to be about God. This is the relationship that he set up. And if husbands and wives are having trouble, this may be something we kind of go back to and say, well, well, you know, the wife may be saying, well, I'm submitting to my husband, but he's not leading. He's not leading the way he's supposed to be. Well, you may not be loving your wife the way you're called to love. And if the husband is saying, well, the wife's not following, uh, maybe she's having trouble with submission. First, you've got to check and make sure that you're you know, displaying that love, that she knows that you put her first, and that you're leading in the right way. And the wife has to make sure that she's in check and understanding this is something that's scripturally based. This is how the family can work. This is how it's supposed to go. Now, here's the thing about it. Uh, the, the devil is going to always try to destroy what God has done. And one of the ways he's going to attack us most is by attacking the family. If he attacks the family, if he renders the family useless, if he breaks up the family, he can start to divide us. Uh, we start, I started thinking about, uh, you know, I was watching something the other day, and uh, we started thinking about a lot of the people that were talking about in this, and they were talking about a lot of people with really high character. And we started noticing as they showed these people with high character, uh, most of them, a lot of them, had a mother and father both that were very present in their life. It's not to say that people that don't have a mother and father can end up have, have being people of high character, but there's a lot greater chance when you have a mother and father doing their job and they're doing what they're supposed to do in Christ. And that's what we're called to do. Uh, we're called to do that. And, uh, husbands and wives, we're called to do that. And we're going to fix and talk about uh, raising children and what the children's job is. Uh, but that's something that we, we should be doing. We should be displaying to this world uh, because this world desperately needs it. 
Uh, the next part, it talks about children obeying, uh, obeying their parents. Uh, we know this, this is all throughout Scripture. It's one of the only promises we give in the Scripture that if you do this, it will result in long life. Uh, so uh, I always kind of joke that uh, I may not live near as long as, as I really hope because I kind of struggle with this at times, obeying my parents. I didn't always get this right because uh, and when the older I got, the, the more uh, intelligent they seemed to become because now the things that uh, they used to tell me to do that I didn't want to do, they make more sense now. Uh, that I'm a little bit older and I've grown up a little bit. Uh, but anyways, uh, children are required to do this. They're required to obey their parents. Uh, and it tells us not only to just obey your parents, it says obey your parents and everything. It says this is pleasing to the Lord. So doing this is not just obeying your parents, but you're actually uh, doing what God has called you to do. You're doing something that pleases God. You're serving the Lord by obeying your parents, even if their rules are, are something that you don't like. Now, there's always exceptions to some of this stuff, and what I mean by that is if there's abuse that's physical, that's verbal, uh, if any of that kind of abuse that's going on, um, you know, we need to really, you know, check on that. If, uh, if a husband is leading, a, is leading the wife and he's, uh, he's doing it in a way that's sinful, uh, then maybe obeying is, is, we need to check and make sure, uh, you know, on, on things like that. But there can be some circumstances that get uh, kind of mixed up there. Uh, but this is one, in general, children should always obey their parents uh, because hopefully the parent loves them and is trying to lead them in the right way. Uh, so this is one that's important. Uh, and it's important to us, it kind of reflects back to our relationship with God, is uh, God is our Father. I know I just said that uh, we're the groom, uh, or He's the groom, and we're the bride. Uh, we're, we're compared to that in a marriage. But it also says that we're children of God in the Bible. And then we're to obey him. Uh, whether we like it or not, whether we want to pout about it or not, we're supposed to always obey. And that's something we struggle with because all of us would probably admit that we still sin. We don't always get it right. Even though we know Jesus, even though we love Jesus, even though we love what he's done for us, we, you know, we want to serve him, we still struggle. Uh, and the thing we have to understand is even if we struggle, even if we don't understand, obey because we know his plan is better than ours. Uh, how many times have we tried to do things in life and realized his plan is so much better? We've been trying to do something uh, that he's already got the answers to. But anyways, uh, the next part of it, it goes into kind of, as he talks about fathers, I think this can probably end up going uh, towards most parents. But uh, if you really think about fathers, uh, a lot of the disciplines, the kind of stuff you know, came from my father. You've heard this, you know, uh, the whole the old saying, uh, wait till your father gets home. I've heard that a few times when I was, you know, uh, growing up, but but this is something I think is important for fathers and mothers to understand with their children. It says not to provoke your children, and uh, what that really means is we don't just discipline, uh, but let them know they're loved, that you know that, that they're cared for, that everything they do is is not wrong sometimes because sometimes your kids feel that way uh, because you, you get on to them about something they they feel uh, that everything's bad that they never get it right. But we need to make sure that we encourage them, that we show them their love, they're cared for too. Uh, because all of us need that. We all need encouragement sometimes. We all need uh, a little pick-me-up sometimes. And, and it tells us in there, that it, it tells us in the scripture uh, that we're not to do those things because it can be dis discouraging to these children. Uh, we don't want to discourage them. We want to keep them encouraged in the faith. We want to keep them encouraged in Christ. So, um, that part of it is, is really goes out to families too. That is uh, to be aware of that. To be aware of, uh, not, you know, children need discipline. Uh, they crave it. They may not admit it. They, they probably never would, would say it out loud, but they do. They crave it. They love discipline. They love order, even though they say they don't, and even though they fight it and fight it, they need it, and they don't even realize it. Uh, so um, make sure we we do that, but also make sure we're encouraging. And I had parents that were great with that, um, that were great in encouragers, uh, that told me they loved me, that told me they were proud of me. Uh, and we need to make sure we tell them those, you know, tell our children those things too. Uh, I think that's actually a biblical thing uh, to, to do those things. The next part, it talks about bond servants. And it tells, uh, talks about bond servants and they're basically telling them to work with integrity. Uh, a lot of people, that if the boss is around, they're gonna work really, really hard because the boss is watching, as long as the boss is there. But when the boss slips off, are you still going to work as hard as you would when the boss was standing right over you? 
uh, kind of you know looking and checking on what you're doing. Are you going to try to slack off a little bit? Because that's kind of what the scripture is talking about. It's just not as eye pleasers, not as people pleasers. We're not doing that. He said, even if you're required to do something, you do it for the Lord. Now, why would it use a bond servant in there? Uh, it would use a bond servant because that was part of the times when the Bible was actually written. Uh, there were bond servants. And a lot of people in our today's society said, well, the Bible it is not a good book because it doesn't specifically speak out against slavery and stuff like that. It actually does, in my opinion. The book of Philemon uh, speaks out against slavery. Uh, it tells them to take a bond servant that ran away. It tells them he ran away, he found Christ, and, then, and it tells uh, this guy that actually was the, the master or the owner of this guy to take him back, not as a bond servant, but as a friend, as a brother in Christ, actually is what it says. So I, I think it does speak out against it, but it's actually telling people how to act with character, how to act with integrity, how to represent Christ by even being in, in bad situations because bad situations happen here on this earth. Uh, if the Bible were to pick out every bad thing that uh, that's been done in history, then uh, it would all we would have a lot bigger book uh, because of all the things I had to point out. But it's telling bond servants here to work, and I think this kind of relates back to us in a different way too. Is uh, most of us have some kind of job, or you've had a job, you've had to work for somebody else, uh, and if you've worked for somebody else, not necessarily that you may have been a bond servant, but you're working, you should be working for something bigger uh, than yourself. Uh, the next verse. After this, says, whatever you do, you work heartily as for the Lord and not for men. Um, and, and what we're doing, what we're working for, is something bigger than ourselves. We're working to represent what we believe in, to represent Jesus Christ. And if we're working towards that, we're working towards what we believe in, we're not just going to work hard when somebody's watching us. We're going to work hard all the time because we know what we're really working for. And can you ever hide from God? Uh, do you ever fool him? Do you ever trick him? No, you can't. He, we, we can't hide what we do from him. So he's always looking. He always notices. He always knows what's going on. So we need to be working for him and not just working for people. Well, you know, and understand that about everything that we do. And I think it involves our jobs, our work too, but it also involves everything else. And then it talks about an inheritance. And it says, uh, knowing that from the Lord you will receive an inheritance as your reward you are serving the Lord Christ. Sometimes we think uh, that a lot of the things that we do here on earth go unnoticed. But even if they seem to go unnoticed, and it's good for us to give each other a pat on the back. or, or to, I think it's good that uh, uh, my wife is great about writing uh, thank you cards and stuff like that when people do. And, and I think that's great uh, that we do stuff like that. But we have to understand that even when we don't feel like we get that recognition, when we're doing what we're supposed to do for Christ, he always knows. We're building an inheritance in heaven. Not just that we get to go to heaven, but that we actually will have rewards for us there. How awesome is that? And not only do we get to go to heaven, but he's going to reward us for just being good, doing what we're supposed to do. You know, so uh, that's an awesome thing to think about, too. We're doing those things, building that uh, inheritance. It says, for the wrongdoer will be paid back, for the wrong you have done, there is no partiality. God's gonna, God is a God of justice, and he's going to have his justice. So whether it's good or whether it's bad, he sees. So we want to do what's good, so we're building uh, that inheritance. Uh, that when we see him, that we've done all we can for his kingdom and for his glory here on this, on this earth. The next whole part, it talks about masters. It says masters are to treat bond servants fairly. Uh, I think this, uh, again, it goes back to, like, if you are the employer, uh, you know, you are. You know, you've got employees under you uh, that, that are that are working for you. Uh, I think it relates back to how you should treat uh, the people that work for you. Uh, the, the, are you treating them fairly? Are you treating them justly? Are you kind of following the golden rule, do unto others as you would have them do unto you? Are you are you doing those things to the people that work for you? Uh, because you should be, and that's a good way that we can kind of represent Christ uh, in that way, uh, in the way that we have people work under us. Uh, so whether you're working for somebody or you're working uh, or you're working under somebody or if you're or when you're work or people are working for you rather, then there's ways that the Bible is telling us that we should make sure we uh, have a character, have integrity, and there's ways that we do that. Uh, so the things that we have to really think about and the questions we have for us tonight is uh, one is what is our role with the family and how are we fulfilling it? 
because uh, all of us have some kind of role within uh, a family of, of some kind. Uh, even if you're single, you, you have a family that you belong to of uh, some kind, and you, you may have uh, some of these roles you represent with other people. There's somewhere in what we've talked about tonight, I know you fit into something uh, that we've talked about. So what is your role? What is the role that God has given you, and how are you fulfilling it? How are you uh, living out what he's called you to do? And the next thing is, uh, what are we working for? If you have a job, or uh, if there's something that you're doing, or uh, there, there's anything that you can really think about in that, that kind of area, what are you truly working for? Are you working to make a paycheck? Are you working to pay a mortgage? Are you working to pay a car payment or, or, or to pay insurance, to pay all those things? Are you really working for the Lord? And you just get, uh, you know, you, you get to pay those bills and stuff with the money you make. Uh, but, but our job's not just a job that we're working for money. We have a chance to represent Christ with the people that we work with. And that should be part of our attitude toward work. I know it's not always been my, that for me. Uh, I know that I've, I've failed at that you know, before too, but that's really what we're supposed to do. You don't have to work in a church to be working for the Lord. You're working for the Lord in everything that you do. And the next thing is how are we treating other people? Because regardless of how we fit in that, uh, regardless of what role we play in the things we talked about, uh, how we treat people really matters. And I think that's been evident through what Paul is really telling us. How, we, how are we treating others is, is really important because a lot of times that reflects what we really believe about a God, what we really believe about Jesus Christ and what he taught us. So I just want you to think about those things. Uh, think about what, how these things are reflected in your life and, uh, and how these questions can be answered. And if you don't like the answers to the questions, uh, that'd be something that you can give to the Lord. Remember, the Lord is... Full of is is just, but he's full of grace and mercy and love. And you come to him and ask for forgiveness, he will. He'll forgive you for it if you have failed at any of these things and try to make them right. I try to make it right by God first and then by the people. So uh, we just want to tell you we love you. We want to pray for you. And then uh, we'll see you later. Uh, Father God, just uh, I want to say thank you. Thank you for the many uh, blessings you've given us. Uh, Father, thank you that uh, uh, we have technology even during... Uh, times that uh, we don't even really understand. You know, Father, just uh, uh, please guide and guard and direct all the people uh, from Central Heights, from, uh, from around the world. Uh, Father, that um, we, we know that you are in control, that we can trust you. And uh, Father, help us, whatever our role is with the family, whatever our role is with work, uh, our role with other people. Uh, Father, just um, help us to represent you in everything that we say, that we do, and even what we think. Father, we love you. We thank you for Jesus. In his holy name we pray. Amen. Love you guys. We can't wait to see you again.